Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha TV. I am Manish Chhabbar. Every vibrant democracy needs a strong, vibrant judiciary. A judiciary that understands the character of the nation, its requirements and one which can step in effectively when the performance of the executive falls severely short of the expectations of the citizens. But in doing so, the judiciary also has to ensure that it doesn't needlessly and too frequently cross the Lakshman Rekha, leading to a constitutional crisis. While it is often said that judiciary has played a major role in shaping our country's development mainly through the public interest litigation, it has also sometimes attracted criticism for its inertia in important matters of public interest. But for those following the legal sector, including students of law and jurisprudence, there is, isn't an adequate empirical evidence to allow a transparent and independent scrutiny of the effectiveness of our judicial system. Is there a need for social history of Indian judiciary or does it exist somewhere in some books or journals and we have not been able to locate them? That is the question we are asking our distinguished panel today as part of a special series on Indian History Congress. Joining us here today is former judge of Delhi High Court, Justice S. N. Dhingra. Welcome, sir. Senior advocate of the Supreme Court of India, San Sanjay Hegde. Welcome and Professor Preetam Barua, Associate Professor, O.P. Jindal Global University. Welcome. Let me begin with you, Justice Dhingra. Do we need uh, a history of the Indian uh, judiciary in, in so far as its social commitment is concerned? I consider there is a very severe necessity, dire necessity of uh, recording what uh, and how the Supreme Court and High Court has been functioning with a with society. society. By society, I do not mean few upper strata of society about which you re read in newspaper daily are some cases which are come into the attraction of uh, media. Here, by society, I mean the downtrodden people who look upon the courts and not only Supreme Court and High Court, who look upon the courts for delivery of justice. And uh, most of them are disappointed that what, what kind of courts we have where even for small workmen's problem, you take years together. So this must, there must be some record that how these courts are functioning vis a vis common man of the society, vis a vis downtrodden strata of society, where and how it is functioning vis a vis few selected people, how it is affecting the people. So there is a necessity, no so, doubt. So sir, if I can ask you, has our judiciary failed in one of the main areas for which it was envisaged and that was ensuring that the gap between the rich and the poor, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is, uh, you know, uh, is bridged? You see, the constitutional mandate for judiciary is rule of law and equality before rule of law. If you read the preamble, it states that the constitution shall ensure the equality of status and opportunity. Now, has the judiciary ensured that there shall be no status consciousness with the judiciary? I find that our judiciary is most status conscious and the very first, second uh, line of the preamble that there shall be equality of status and opportunity has not been followed by judiciary. And status is, has been linked with the opportunity. Today, if you have status, you have opportunities. If you have no status, you have no opportunity. This is even in judiciary and this is true right from, you see, taking cases, conducting cases, and uh, appointments, etc. Strong words coming from a former judge. Mr. Hegde, your views? Well, I tend to agree with Justice Dingra. There is this question of uh, opportunity or equal access to justice. Equal access to justice has remained a pipe dream. You see, the point is that not many people willingly approach the judiciary, they are dragged into it. They are dragged into it either because somebody has foisted a case on them in the criminal courts 
or they have some small civil fight of their own. People don't willingly resort to courts as an instrument of justice and that is because they are overcrowded, they take a, a great deal of time and the end result is pretty uncertain. So there is that gypsy curse which says that may you be cursed with a litigation where you are in the right. That, that is very applicable to the, uh, to the litigant in the Indian judicial system. However, I do not see it as entirely hopeless in the sense that there have been efforts right from the uh, very institution of the constitution to make sure that justice is available to all. The courts have been conscious of the fact, you know, that there have been criticisms like that the Supreme Court is a place for constitutional quibbling for men with long purses. That was in the pre-emergency era. And though contempt proceedings were initiated, but they, then thereafter they, they did not uh, necessarily pursue it. Uh, it was the post, uh, the reaction to the emergency excesses uh, and the Supreme Court's silence at that point of time that they went into public interest litigation. They tried to clean up some stables, but then later on public interest litigation often has uh, become more judge and cause centric than anything else. There was the old uh, English saying that equity is the length of the chancellor's foot. Mm. Today public interest litigation often depends on the judicial interest shown by one or two judicial movers and shakers. You cannot always be certain that every cause that comes to the, uh, uh, under that uh, public interest will be espoused with the same vigor. And the last point I'd like to make is that, you know, there is no organized system in the bar to ensure that everybody mandatorily keeps aside a certain amount of his practice for pro bono work. We, all of us do it, but we do it episodically. We do it because we know a lawyer, we know, uh, we know uh, some friend who is in the, in the profession. But it's only those who have access to our informal circles who get uh, some kind of better representation than they could afford. So, but if the dice is loaded against the litigants because of the high co cost of uh, uh, litigation, don't you think uh, time has come when the judiciary should step in? The judiciary should step in and the judiciary should step in, you know, uh, based on outcomes. So, uh, I, one, one of the things that often happens, uh, Justice Dingra will bear me out, is that most cases are won and lost in the trial court itself. At that stage, to get good quality representation and good quality representation compulsively for a poor man, especially those who are accused of capital crimes or those who are likely to face life in prison, that does not happen because even when you go to legal aid, legal aid has some people on panels or the amicus curiae panels are often people who are waiting to learn their way at the expense of the poor man who is trapped in the system. To get the leaders of the bar and to compulsorily devote their time to a case they, and for the judges to make a choice that no, this is the kind of case that X or Y should compulsorily be asked to assist the court, that rarely happens. Mr. Uh, Professor Barua, if I can come to you, uh, uh, while there is a little doubt that judiciary has performed uh, well, you know, in the most trying of the times, but there is also this thing that sometimes when it is asked or when it is expected of the judiciary to expand the scope of law in order to help the weak and the poor, so some, somewhere uh, it has fallen short of the expectations. Would you agree with that? But I would say that that depends on, you know, different phases in which the higher judiciary can be looked into. There was a phase in the history of the Supreme Court of India where the law was interpreted in very creative ways and which led to, I think, a lot of impact, social impact, you know, in bringing litigants to court. And we discussed the public interest litigation, uh, you know, uh, system, epistolary jurisdiction of the court. But uh, recently, people have started thinking that, you know, there was a backlash against what is now called judicial overreach that you know in trying to creatively interpret the law the court is interfering you know in the realm of the executive or the legislature and that might have led to the court being 
more restrained. And so now the in you know in OPEC pieces you'll find the word judicial restraint much more than the word say judicial activism. So people think that the court should exercise some restraint. But if you looked at a long term history of the um, higher courts of India, I wouldn't say it would be fair to see that the courts uh, the courts have failed in interpreting the law creatively. Rather, I think that they have at different points of time been leaders in the world where you know other courts have looked up to the Indian Supreme Court, say the Supreme Court of South Africa has cited the Indian Supreme Court showing how creatively interpretation can be done. But there's a thin line between creative interpretation and judicial overreach and that is some that is a challenge that we have in front of us today. So I would that's why I disagree with you in a sense to say that it would not be fair to say that the court has not uh, you know uh, widened the realm of the law. Interesting phrase uh, you know judicial restraint versus judicial activism. What's your view on that uh, Justice Dingra? You see let us confine to first social impact. You see let us separate interpretation from management. The courts have miserably failed in judicial management. They, today the situation is that trial courts are not considered even courts by Supreme Court itself and High Court itself. You see if there is a case in trial court, summoning of a common man, see then trial court is a court. But if it is a case of summoning of a VIP, then trial court is not a court. Every case is called by Supreme Court to itself or you approach Supreme Court and the Supreme Court starts exercising the powers of a magistrate. Powers of, uh, you see, the summoning power. See, I fail to understand where is the line drawn by Supreme Court. If the trial courts are not honored and they are rebuked, and you see, the, we make trial courts dependent totally upon the uh, see, uh, wishes of the advocates that they will go, they will function only when advocates want. Otherwise, they won't function. Now, where does the poor litigant go? The Supreme Court is, poor, see, uh, day in, day out, Telling executive how to how you should behave, how you should function with the common citizen. But look at the trial courts where advocates keep on striking and Supreme Court looks at helplessly. It doesn't tell its courts that see the courts are to be managed by the judges. Advocates are the Office. persons who help the litigant in getting justice. They cannot obstruct the justice. If they obstruct the justice by non-appearing or this, then you don't bother about the advocate and proceed with the trial. The trial, it is not only criminal trial going on in the courts. Civil trials are there, small matters are there. And you see there have been recently long strikes in Karnataka, long strikes in Tamil Nadu, where the Supreme Court and High Court, they you see storm the courts. Tell me what action has been taken by these very courts which have pronounced at the rooftop that strikes by advocates are illegal. Mr. What action has been taken? Mr. Hegde. Now the consequence is that these courts are not taken seriously by anybody. And then we have other problem. You show me the face, I will show you the law. This happens in right from trial court to Supreme Court. That if the, there is a petition against Manmohan Singh summoning, then the summoning is stayed and the petition is put in line. He was ex prime minister, no doubt. But there are more co accused facing trial in the same case. Why their trial is going on? Fair enough. Uh, Mr. Hegde, you know, uh, he has made a point, and the point being that, uh, uh, you know, the judiciary is also sometimes. Uh, it's impacted in its decision making power by who who is the litigant. Do you think a uh, time has come to take out some measure of discretion out uh, out of the hands of the judges? No, because ultimately, whatever uh, when you ask for somebody's judgment, you also ask for his exercise of, uh, of discretion. Justice Dingra is absolutely right that you know uh, uh, in in. Uh, his perception of how the superior courts treat the trial courts. 
I have always said that one must remember that the trial judge is your first point of interface with the citizenry. You have to support him at all times. You must also remember that the trial judge does not have constitutional protection. He is liable to disciplinary action by the high courts. And what I have uh, through about ne now nearly three decades of practice seen is that there is an unwarranted atmosphere of distrust where the trial judges are often distrusted by the high court and the high court judges are often distrusted by the e e Supreme Court. There is a certain skepticism about their orders. So th therefore, whenever there is an appeal, they, they, the first instinct is to see, okay, le uh, let's just bring back status quo and then we'll consider it at a, a, at a subsequent point of time. Uh, Justice Dingra gave an, an example of a summoning matter where they say, okay, oh, oh, why uh, was the summon re really necessary? Let's look at it. And, the, and that's why the entire process gets stayed. I think that appellate interference should await final judgments. Appellate interference at the interim stage is often the bane of the uh, system of appeals. The, uh, given uh, uh, having uh, more or less endorsed what Justice Dingra said, I have a small point to make with, with regard to what Mr. Barua said, what um, Professor Barua said. You see this balancing of judicial overreach versus judicial activism. The danger of judicial activism is that soon the executive then decides to step back and say, we will not do anything without a court order. The executive may very well know what needs to be done. But they require the protection of a court order telling them what to do because then subsequently no CAG, no other court can say that you did it for ulterior purposes. So even if you have to release a pension, they say, oh no, yes, 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 you are absolutely right. But somebody has written a note way back uh, you know, two decades ago, which, my, which might cause me problems later. Instead, why don't you, you go to the court and say that I, I am not acting, so give me an order to act. This is the real danger of what, what I could call, uh, what I would not uh, term as uh, overreach or anything else, but micromanagement by the judiciary or uh, in executive issues. Oh, the, uh, by the higher judiciary. By the higher judiciary. But Professor Barua, you know, on, uh, uh, on judicial activism, it has often been said that, you know, whenever the judiciary passes an order, which the government likes, then it goes and implements that. But whenever there is an order which the government is hesitant in uh, implementing, then it uh, uh, you know somehow manages to find a way not to implement that. Would you agree? Yes, I think you know what you just asked Manish closely ties in with what I think the other you know, my co-panelists were trying to aim at that there are systemic questions involved, and in these system in so the judicial system just doesn't function as the court functioning. It function, functions in a context with other political actors. There, there are important political actors within the judicial system we, who are allied. For example, there's the police, there is the prosecution. So do we have we thought about creatively in terms of reforms in those sectors? Because that is what is actually going to impact the quality of justice that is going to come out of courts. On the other side, there are other political actors like, you know, say the higher executive or, you know, members of parliament. There I would agree with you that Sometimes courts are cautious. They sometimes they pass orders, and journalists and other legal minds would criticize them, saying that this is a kind of order which will never get implemented. Don't make a mockery of yourself. So you have the courts have to think about it that perhaps this will not get implemented, given our pathological context, where you know the, the integrity of all our institutions to some extent is in question. But I just wanted to say something about what you said right in the beginning, which I think is very important from the point of view of a social history. You asked a question about effectiveness of the judicial system. And I think some of the social history of our judiciary has been written. For example, on PILs it has been written. On delays, I think there is agreement. Everybody agrees that there is this big problem, an elephant in the room. But what do we do about it, right? And there is um, agreement on questions about problems of, uh, prob problems of appointment of judges. But the social history that is missing is that how do we prove many of these through what you said, empirical studies. 
So recently there have been some empirical studies showing that what are the kind of cases that come before the Supreme Court of India. It is not a court where mostly rights cases come up. Large part of the cases are actually in cases involving big, you know, say corporate interests or, you know, uh, commercial matters, big ticket matters. So that kind of empirical evidence will probably make our policy makers reflect on this, that what is actually going on in our judicial system, not just the Supreme Court. Now, do we have an independent prosecutorial system? Yes, you know, other countries have it. You know, Brazil has a wonderful pro independent prosecutor's office. Do we have that to prosecute, you know, uh, um, people in high offices? And the judges then won't, you know, probably feel threatened. They have an allied person within, you know, the judicial system. Police reforms is not getting anywhere. So I think that this systemic question is what we ought to ask. And we want, need to write a social history of the judiciary in the context of this wider impact through these officers, which are a part of the judiciary, judicial reform in that yeah. sense, yes. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Justice Dhingra, you know, he's just referred to PAL. And PAL, uh, I'm sure we all agree that PAL has done a lot of good to this country. But sometimes judicial overreach also happens in the, uh, uh, while hearing PAL matters. Do you think time has come to now regulate PAL? In many judgments, courts have said uh, PAL is turning into publicity interest. Political PAL interest. is not only turning into publicity interest, it has become personal interest litigation as well. See, PILs are got filed even by judges for their own benefit through advocates into the courts. If the judges want to add some service or years of their practice into, you see, the counting of their pension rates, they get a PIL filed from a known advocate and uh, get uh, some number of years of practice added. So this is change of conditions of service, which actually only legislature can do. What court is doing is unethical, I would say, because if you are overreaching the legislature by uh, adding your, for your own benefit, adding the number of practice into service and getting more pension, I consider it is unethical. And this has happened in Supreme Court, in High Court, and for trial courts also. I'm not saying that this happened only in Supreme Court. Supreme Court judges number of practice has been added into their service. High Court judges practice number of practice has been added into service. And in the trial court judges also practice has been added into service. So service conditions have been changed but were there in this. If these conditions can't be changed in case of other employees. Say an employee who is working privately as engineer if he joins government in engineer and uh, his number of years are less, can uh, the, will the government jo uh, add those private number of uh, years? No, it will not. But this has been done in case of judges. It is personal interest litigation. And then surprisingly, PIL is consuming so much time of the court that, that and there is no effective system that what kind of PLs will be admitted, what kind of PLs will be. There is no rule regulation in respect of rules of, uh, rules of business even in uh, Supreme Court and in High Court. Hmm. Any case can be taken first, any case can be put. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hegde, you know, when we are talking about the social history of our judiciary, you know, one will also have to talk about the instances where the judiciary uh, fell short of the expectations. And I am talking about recent instances, uh, uh, Section 377, the recent order on national anthem. Do you think uh, these are aberrations or have they become the norm now? A quick answer. They, they, they are still aberrations. They, there is that odd thing that, uh, uh, that uh, raises eyebrows. But uh, uh, that often happens with the social history of the judges themselves. Because Unlike other countries, we do not really audit our judicial appointments before they are made in terms of whether somebody has a particular pronounced view on any topic and things like that. So, uh, uh, And given the fact that our Supreme Court sits in benches, sometimes what happens is that one bench holds one way hmm. and uh, 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 that the composition of the bench itself matters greatly as you know. I have often asked judges that you know when there are important matters or for the nation, why don't you informally at least talk over it in the lunch room? They, people said no, that can't be done, that would be a violation of our judicial discipline. Well, I am 
pretty sure that the 377 matter that you asked about, if the judge is concerned, had informally asked in the lunchroom, this is what we think it is, they would at least have been exposed to their brothers telling them that these are likely to be the consequences. Professor Barua, your final comments? Yes, I think that, you know, uh, Mr. Hegre has raised a very important issue in terms of thinking about, you know, some, uh, you know, what is this audit of, you know, the views that judges have or how do, how do their views get, you know, um, between themselves discussed more before you actually um, deliver a judgment. I think that is something which raises a very important question which at least in academic circles when people working on the Indian judiciary are starting to think about which is that how do we think about yeah. maintaining a consistent quality and competence of the judiciary institutionally. We have to think about it institutionally. We cannot just think about you know, uh, uh, you know that our systems are fine and not just about individual judges which has happened. There are books now written on individual judges. But how do we ensure that our systems are such that we always have institutionally guaranteed right uh, you know judicial competence of some sort in the system all the time i think a lot of these problems about no rules being there precedent not being followed yeah. reasoning not being rigorous would then you know take care would be taken care of yes i'm sorry we would have loved to continue this discussion we, we are running short of time hmm. it was a wonderful exchange of ideas and while there were different thoughts i think there was unanimity that the courts have to play a more important role in ensuring that all the citizens have a level playing field. Also, yes, we do need the social history of Indian judiciary. Thanks and keep watching Rajasabha television.